Okay, so welcome everyone to so welcome everyone to this um uh, uh chapter twenty eight for Quarto. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today is a bit more uh, overviewy. So the first part of uh, the material is about what these Quarto files kind of look like. How could you see it? in your computer and how they are stored in your computer and then their their contents and afterwards i'll talk about some of the i put every or at least the keyboard shortcuts that are in in that chapter in into one location and then talk about how to design uh, some parts of a quarto document specifically these code chunks and then we'll recreate we'll do a couple of exercises so roughly that's the that's the plan for for today. Um, so one thing that I want to point out is that the chapter is a bit long, but it looks a bit long, but uh, it's actually very, uh, every subsection is very, very compressed. Uh, and it's really meant to be a broad overview of the of this authoring framework, okay? So you, this unified authoring framework will become clear in a, in a moment. Uh, but essentially, the idea is that you want to put all of your text, computations, means of communication into one document, and then you have the ability to produce uh, produce output in different formats. So you could have format for a website like HTML, or you could have a format PDF you know, uh, for those who want that, and uh, DocX for those who would who would really prefer Microsoft Word. So and I think in most uh in a lot of cases, uh you will encounter people who would prefer uh Microsoft Word than getting a PDF or an HTML. So uh this is very useful in that uh in that sense. You have one one file that enables you to move uh across formats. Of course, there are snags around the way, and I think uh, chapter twenty nine will will talk about that. But for 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 our purposes, we'll be focusing on the the creation of the document uh, itself for the moment. Okay, so uh, so the the chapter introduction has sort of like a, a design purposes of having these quarto files, and I invite you to have a have a look at all of these um but the basic idea is really for me for me as a user of quarto it's really to put to have one file a centralized file to allow me to move across formats and at the same time communicate my communicate results from uh using r and uh putting it all in one document so that you could track it down it's kind of like a lab notebook but a fancier one so that's how I would uh, how I would characterize it okay so so the the first couple of things that I want to also point out is there are many ways to see a quarto file uh this document that you see right now is actually generated from a from a quarto file which is actually a text file with a file extension called qmd okay and the QMD really looks like this, okay? okay? So you have uh, a section that has this kind of, that was blocked away, and then you have the main text, and there is formatting here and there, okay? So essentially that's uh, what you see. You could see it as a text file. And in fact, you could also see it not as part of our studio. You could open it as a, you know, in your favorite notepad or whatever. You could also see it as a, text file like this without the without the color scheme okay so that's one way of seeing a quarto document okay um the other way of seeing a quarto doc document is to see it being rendered okay and what i mean by that is there's a button here called render and the idea is to produce a format that would be more sort of like uh more in touch with with what we are used to seeing so instead of seeing it as a text file uh that has this um 
formatting codes and you know symbols here that might not be uh pleasant for some it it you, it you could convert it into something much more pleasing to the eyes so you, when you click on render you would be able to produce that uh that document and it would put it would produce something like this in your browser for example if your form if your target format is html okay so this is what you see right now and what you see in the link that i dropped is they're both um rendered versions of a, of a qmd file okay and then another another way of seeing a qmd file or a or a quarto file is through these two buttons that you see here you see a source which is the text version of uh of a qmd file which really the tech at its core it's text and then you have a more uh visual version where it kind of looks like you're you're working with a google doc of sorts and you can see here you could format bold italics uh and then you could have these headers and then you could also insert images okay so it's it's actually an interface that is very intuitive so when i first encountered quarto i don't think there was a visual editor yet so it was you know so i was used to seeing it this way so when i worked through the chapter uh this was the first time that i actually even bothered clicking visual <laughs> so yeah so uh there and it's actually very extremely convenient extremely convenient you could create tables you could insert or just about anything okay and you have these kind of formatting that is directly accessible without you remembering all of those uh uh code that is specific like for instance if you want to have a header the heading one uh you use this uh this pound sign or a hashtag sign uh that will be your heading one and then this one two of them will be heading two and so on so instead of remembering that you could use the visual part to create that for you and as you can see here this is header one and in this one if you click you put your cursor there you'll see header two so this is very very uh convenient okay so uh, this these two modes you know, source or visual uh really depends on the user so for me i i, I kind of got used to the source one but it's nice to see a visual representation of what you've seen so far and in fact in one of the exercises you'll see you'll be asked to uh you'll be asked to start from the visual part and then see what the source kind of looks like so i think that's a useful uh exercise at the end of the day Okay, because for for the most so for the most um common of tasks the visual mode could do i think most of it but if you want to have a bit more control over what you want to show or how you want it to be shown then you you do need this uh source part, at least some facility uh in doing in using this uh source mode okay so those are the ways of uh, seeing a quarto file, okay? And there are some keyboard shortcuts. I, admittedly, I don't use a lot of them. Sorry, there's a, there's a question. Oh, okay. So Lydia mentions that uh, sometimes uh, they run into an issue where switching from source to visual back to source distorts, distorts my source code. Oh, interesting. So yeah, and it happens to tables too. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, so, with the formatting, especially. Yeah. yeah, I see. So for for me that that so for me I I I I rarely do it. <laughs> so it's nice to hear 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 those uh, uh kinks here and there uh with respect to moving back and forth. It's kind of like Google Translate. So if you you have something in a foreign language translate to english and then translate it back you might get something ridiculous i guess that's the that's the analog uh to it yeah and jeremy i think uh mentioned um something similar and uh what what they suggest is to put the tables in an r chunk 
to avoid those issues. Okay. So I, I haven't, I think I haven't done that. Yeah. Ah, the tables in the sense that you use the cable package or some other package that produces the table in, in R first and then pops it out rather than literally inserting a table. I guess, uh, I guess, that, yes, that, that I guess that's what they mean. Uh, if you want to do on pure markdown, you just put your markdown code in the R chunk and you print it as S is in the results settings in the R, in the R chunk. I see. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's nice. there's, there's a, I think there's a way to print out results. I rather even print out in like HTML or S is and I just use it in the settings of S is so it thinks that the R chunk is a markdown. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I when, see that. Because of this, right? Because when I switch to the visual mode, uh, the R chunk becomes still still becomes an R chunk. It's not the table that Bottle has. So I can still do like back and forth while avoiding this source code changing issue. I see. I see. So the, 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 that's an option called as is. I think that that's what I got from you. Is, is that right? As is? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it used to be happens in the in the R markdown. Uh, I think let, let me uh, give me some time to. Yeah, it, it would be nice to know know what what that is. No, but I've never used it. So great. Thank thanks for that, Jeremy. Uh, so let, let me just move on a bit. Now, so you you. So there are a couple of these keyboard shortcuts that I put down here. Uh, I think they're very, very convenient, especially for inserting a code chunk, okay? So I'll I'll talk about why it's very convenient in a moment, okay? Okay, so, so let me go back to this uh, QMD file, okay? So this text file. So as you can see here, you, you can see headers, you can see text, you could see lists, a numbered list, one, two, three, and sublists. And you could also see uh, formatting that has this, uh, uh, I don't know what's this called, but this, uh, this accent, no, this accent symbol uh, that could be used to enclose material that you want to show uh, as is, okay? And then you you could have these kinds of uh, bold, okay, formatting, okay, okay. And perhaps mo most importantly, there is sort of like code chunks. Let me show you that, okay, as an example. This is an example of a, of a code chunk where you see the first part here is enclosed by these uh, three accent marks. And this is telling you that we have to do this. In, this is being processed in R, okay? And then you have, uh, you have an indicate, you have something here like a hashtag and a, and a, uh, a vertical, vertical line, okay? Uh, the tell that sort of like gives options of how gives you some control over what you want uh quarto to do with this uh code chunk okay so these code chunks are probably one of the most uh uh important parts of a quarto document okay so so that's why having this uh keyboard shortcut of inserting a code chunk you no know, Control Alt I or Command Option I. I think this is for Mac users. No, never never use this, so I think Mac users would know this more. Uh, for me, I I use I would use Control Alt I, and this would give you that code uh chunk. So if you if you do that here, yeah. So that's very very extremely convenient. Instead of typing all of these things down, and definitely in in visual mode, in visual mode you could insert just about anything, okay? And you could, it's, it's already there. And here you have an R code chunk and it will do that for you. So it's extremely convenient. And if you go back to source, you'll see that part there, okay? There. So those are uh, code chunks that are 
an integral part of uh, of a Quarto uh, document. Now, if you want to design these code chunks, there there are some nice things that are discussed in the book that I think uh, you should pay pay attention to. Uh, one is that uh, these code chunks could be inlined or inline or displayed. So the example that I just shown you, okay. These are not inline uh, code chunks. They they are supposed to be displayed, but you could also control whether or not they would literally appear on the rendered file. Okay, uh, an example of an inline uh, an example of an inline code chunk is this example here. So if you notice the difference between this kind of code chunk that is displayed and a code chunk that is inline is that this inline thing has this one accent here and then followed by R. This one here is uh, three and then followed by R, okay? Uh, another thing that is different between these two is that the, the code that you have here that you enclose in this one accent mark and R uh, becomes part of the, of, of the running text rather than a separate thing from the text. Okay, so that's uh, what, what is meant by uh, an inline uh, code chunk. So this will typically be very useful for generate, if you want to generate reports uh, that depend on numbers that are calculated in the background and they and you want, you don't want to alter this number every time there's an update to your code or an update to your data set, for example. So it allows a seamless integration of uh, what is being calculated in the background and then making it a part of the document rather than seeing first what the what this looks like in R and then copying and pasting uh, into this QMD file. Okay, so that that is a, I think that is a good thing for reproducibility and it's also a good thing for tracking, uh, tracking put potential errors, okay? Because sometimes in a complicated report, you have so many numbers that are part of the in inline text and you may fail to update some of those numbers, okay? This, it might not be a very crucial thing, but we, we never know because some reports could be used by others for different purposes. And you, we we want to be a bit more careful about that. So this, this feature is a good thing in, in that sense. Yeah, so Lydia mentions that, uh, that they never used uh, inline code, but it reminds them of the difference between doing inline LaTeX math, math equations. Yeah, so you have the dollar dot, you have this dollar x dollar versus uh dollar dollar x dollar dollar something like that. So yeah, so one is displayed li literally like as a on its own, and then one is a part of the text itself. That's right. I think that 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 is also uh analogous. Yeah. So. Yeah. So these code chunks could be in line or displayed depending on your purpose. Okay. And then the other thing is that it's possible to have uh, options for your code chunk okay, that is specific to that uh, chunk only. So that I would call them a local chunk uh, option. So for example, here you would see a chunk option that is prefaced by a hashtag in this uh, vertical line. And you have something that looks like this. This is an option. And here you see a different set of options. Okay. Here you also see a different set of options. So depending on uh, on what you want, you know, th those uh, code options are specific to the chunk uh, that they are present in. In contrast, you have uh, global chunk options and these global chunk options are part of uh, YA of the YAML or maybe YAML, I don't know the pronunciation, but uh, that YAML is the one that you see at the very, very top of a Quarto file. Okay, so let me go back to that. 
So this very top part, that's the YAML header, okay? Uh, and uh, the, the book has a discussion of that um, in this part, no, 28.10. And I invite you to have a look uh, at, that, uh, at that portion. So it's called a uh, YAML ain't markup language. So I think this is like the GNU thing, you know, G the GNU acronym, which is very similar to how they uh, they created this um, abbreviation. Okay, yeah. So there, uh, so that header, okay, that you that you see here is global. And uh, here you could see the some of those um, you know title date author even and then the format which you could also change okay and you could also have other options and some of those global options or at least the most used global options could be seen in twenty eight point ten okay so I'll 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 talk about them in a moment okay so so that's uh that's the YAML part. Okay, you could have global options and you could have local options. Okay. And then it's generally good practice. And I I I typically forget this. Uh but it's good practice to have a label for your chunks. Okay. Because it turns out that one thing that is nice about the interface okay, in our studio is this part here. Okay. In this part. You could click this part and you could see the chunks are labeled, okay? And it becomes easier to sort of like uh, get to the, if you have a descriptive enough ch chunk label, you could uh, easily track down uh, what you want to look for, okay? So that's a, I think that's a good thing. For a small document like this, it's not a biggie, but for bigger documents or documents that depend on other documents then it becomes uh more unwieldy okay so let me see the chat first oh so jeremy put something in the chat about um uh, uh i think this this is about enclosing um enclosing the table within an r code chunk okay i'll, I'll have a look into that in a moment okay so there um yeah so these chunk labels are 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 very important for that uh for that purpose another another thing that is uh very useful about these chunk labels is that these chunk labels have sort of like an automatic feature which allows you to uh refer to them as you process, as you go, as you process a document. So, for example, one is so the first one that I that I talked about is easier navigation. The other one is if your chunk has a particular format like this one. Okay, sorry, this one, you have a TBL dash. Okay, that is sort of like an a uh a way, if you put it this way, then this table that is being produced, okay, this code chunk actually produces a table and you could refer to this uh, table within the text. So you could insert a cross-reference, okay? So if you go to visual mode, you could insert a cross-reference and in that, and then you would load those cross-references and. I think one of those would be the table. So it parses the document and then looks for that uh, cross-reference. But I, I think this is this is one of the this I think this is one of the disadvantages of of uh of having this visual kind of option because it might take a long time to load. But uh these cross-references could be easier to do with the um, which is a direct uh with just a direct, sorry, oops. Oh yeah, see, now it's uh, it's it's getting uh stuck. So this is so it's nice to have this uh 
uh, happen here. Uh, yeah. So one of the advantages of you of working with the source is that it might be better to do cross reference referencing there because you already if you labeled them very well then you just refer to that label directly okay? rather than ask uh, our studio to parse through the entire document looking for they are aggregating all of those labels and then putting them into tape some of them will be tables some of them will be figures and then you know the the convenience comes at the price i think in in this sense yeah. so there uh i think i have i have to kill this one Let's see yeah i have to do it again uh, and then uh, okay there so i think it's it's much better to to do to do it here so maybe i'll, I'll do i'll just do something like TV something like that. And let me render this. Hoping it works. Yeah, uh, sorry, I didn't, I shouldn't have put the table part here. So here you see table one right away. Okay, so it's, it's uh, a neat way of uh, referring to these um, tables within the within the document. Okay. So this is one nice thing about having those chunk labels Okay. Another thing that is very nice is about uh, caching these computationally intensive tasks. So what I mean by that is sometimes your R code would feature a very computationally expensive part. And every time you render the document, you have to repeat those computations, those, co those expensive ones. So there's an option for you to sort of like store the the results of those computation and intensive tasks in a temporary location of sorts. So I, I won't go through in the detail about that, but it's in section 28.8. And uh, there is some discussion about, uh, about that part here. And I think that's an important, uh, that's also an important feature. But the calculations that you see in the chapter are not computationally expensive. And uh, the the example that is in 28.8 may look a bit artificial that you might not see the point, but if you replace it with a very expensive uh, set of computations, then it becomes uh, more salient uh, that you need this uh, feature. Okay. And then, uh, so the, the thing is that you have to put these chunk labels, but you have to make sure that those chunk labels are unique and and one of the labels that you have to be mindful of is the setup uh, label because this means something special uh, in in quarto. So I have uh, an example of that here, I think. Yeah, this one. So typically this setup part is really used to load all of these libraries and if you want to control uh, you have sort of like you want to load libraries, you want to set a working directory or something like that. I think you would put it here in this uh, uh, setup code chunk. Okay. And then finally about designing these chunks, um, it's a good thing to sort of like layer these chunk options to tailor to the audience. So the nice thing about um, these labels is that you could control how you would want the chunk to appear uh, or at least the output from those chunks or the chunk itself, how they would appear uh, in the final rendered report. So 28.5.2, this one has some discussion about that. And there's a, there's a part here where you don't want the code to be evaluated. So that's one option. You have include colon false, which runs the code, but doesn't show the code or the results. Okay. And then you have echo colon false, which you don't want people to see the code, but you want to show the results of the output from that code. 
and so on. And there's a table here that summarizes what uh, would be seen and what would not be seen in the in the rendered file. Okay, so I think I'll I'll leave it at that uh, for for this part. Okay, so essentially, <clears throat> those are probably the the core uh, things to to pay attention to uh, when you design your uh, quarto document. Okay. <clears throat> And then I'll go a bit to the exercises. One of the exercises is, uh, I think it's, hmm, let me, let me look for it. Uh, this one. One of the things that, that is available in, in the chapter is this figure, figure 28.5, which is the one that you see here. So this is a screenshot of, um, uh, you know, common things that you would do for the formatting of a particular document. You know? So how you would want it to appear. Uh, and this has no reference to our computations. You no, know? so this 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 part is purely um <clears throat> not not very R specific. Not in that doesn't involve our computations at all. Okay, so you could reproduce this this code okay and uh i think there's a solution in the in the book itself uh but i also put it here in uh in in, in a qmd file okay so you you get to have a bird's eye view of what to what you could do so you could have italics bold underline okay so if you want to do underline this part in the square brackets is the one that is being underlined. And then this dot underline is the, the signal to underline the thing that you want to underline inside those square brackets. Okay? And then you have strike through uh, in small caps, uh, code no, that you want to display verbatim. And then you have subscripts and uh, superscripts. Okay? I think I rarely use these two but most of the time I would use these two italic bold strike out and code. Okay. And then for headings, you could have the, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, these hashtags, and you could also have lists and you, ha you have to be very careful about the formatting of these uh, lists because sometimes they, they have to be typed in a very specific way. Otherwise the list would look weird. So I don't know if I could recreate what I what I meant by that, but I think let me, let me show you that this one. Okay. So I did I messed with it for a while and let me just show you the rendered file. Okay. And let me oops, sorry. Let me see if it's if it got messed up. Ah, yeah, see, it got messed up, right? So the 2A and 2B should be sub, sub, a sub list of item two. So if you don't, it doesn't mean that if you put it down this way, that it would look automatically be recognized as sub list. So you have to be a bit careful. So you see the change in color here. You know, here you have a black, uh, pure black, and this is gray. Okay, or if, if you could see it, no, I'm not sure, but yeah. Uh, but there would be a change in the color scheme uh, to signal that you moved from a list to a sub list. So you have to be a bit careful about those. So see, like that one, it may look like a, superficially it might look like a sub list, but it's not, okay? And here, see, it works this way. You don't even have to put this extra space, uh, extra carriage return. You only have to do it this way. And I think it should work. Let me just do the rendering. Okay. And as you can see, I've been rendering quite a few times. So if you have a very expensive computation, either you do the cache or you take it out. No. Uh, yeah. So you see something like this. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's uh, those are the things that uh, that you see from lists some things to pay attention to the other the next one are links and images so you have links 
you have the link phrase and then you have the parentheses here for the actual link. And then you have uh, how you are gonna insert an image file, okay? So you have this part is the one that you use as a signal for an image file. And then the square brackets is the caption. This is the location of the file. So here you have to download quarto.png, which is from the Quarto website, and then put, put it within the same directory as the QMD file that you have. And then this one are the, are the options. I my impression is that this is this is HTML specific, okay. But I'm not very sure, okay. Uh, and then you could also generate tables. So you this is best done using the insert using the visual editor, I think, okay. Because I wouldn't even remember how to do this by hand. Uh, back when there was no visual, I went to those websites where you could create uh you call this uh you could create a table on uh at a website and then generates the corresponding markdown text for it you know, so and then paste it there so that's how i did it before okay there so that's those are probably what you see in uh in figure in figure 28.5 okay and here they show you the visual way of doing things. And then you could also adjust. The nice thing about the visual part is that you could adjust it very much freely compared to you using the source. So each of those representations have uh, advantages and disadvantages. And then, and then another, yeah, Let's see the extras. Yeah, so there are, a couple of nice exercises here, like for example, inserting a citation. So this might this might uh, cause your R Studio to to choke, just like how it happened with mine earlier. Uh, you could insert a citation, and we could do that just to demonstrate. Last night it worked for me without any problem. But now let me see. So you have uh, you insert a citation, okay, and then I'll choose from DOI because the DOI is available to me. Okay. So I'll, I'll copy that uh, DOI link, put that here, and then this there will be a search. And last, last night when I tried this, this was fast. Yeah. So, yeah. There, thankfully it worked. And then you you put on insert and then it produces the corresponding formatting for the citation. And one thing that I want to point out is that it created this extra line here for the bibliography. And it creates this file called references.bib. And this references.bib is a bib tech uh, document that contains how uh, sort of, sort of like data about the citation that you the, about the about the about the thing that you cited and then uh the details about it and uh and you could see it as a text file okay so let me just render this so that you could you could see it okay. and if you do that here at the end you see, this is the references. It generates it uh, automatically for you. So this is very, very nice. And this really gives you no excuse not to cite uh, your sources. Of course, some people still cite sources even though they copy direct, you know, everything. But, you know, yeah. So those are, yeah. Uh, and then let me just show you what references.bib looks like. So I open it with a notepad with, with some notepad. And this is really what this bibtech file bibliography kind of looks like. So it has that information that is expected of an article in in bibtech's uh language. And uh and then it automatically becomes processed in a way that would would be in a format that we would be able to read much more quickly okay. 
And you have the option to change the citation formats on the fly as well. So there's this, a discussion about that in the YAML header as well. Okay. So it's it really made things very, very convenient in terms of uh you know these these tasks that used to be very, very annoying are now very easy to do. Okay, so there's really no excuse to not to use these uh features, especially the citation features. And then another thing that I, I, I'm going to skip some of these exercises because you could do this uh, directly, but I wanted to point this one out. Um, the other exercise here is in 28.4.1 about the CV. This is a, a nice exercise to do. Um, another, uh, another exercise here, which is about the diamond sizes, they are actually already part of the of chapter 28. So this exercise is a little bit um, redundant in, in that sense. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment, okay? But uh, probably a very interesting exercise is this one, okay? So where you have a Google document, a Google doc or an MS Word document, and then you copy it and paste it into, into the visual editor. And then you look at what the source looks like. So I'll give you an example. This is the program for the big team science conference. And uh, there's a Google Doc for the conference program. And it's actually a very complicated, not very complicated, but still a sub like this one. This is a substantially difficult table to design. Well, at least it takes time to make it. So what I'm going to do is just copy this, and then paste it. Paste it here, there, and then render it. Oops, let me just save it. Uh, just a moment, sorry. R for D. R for R for D. There. Okay, so I put big team there and then render it. Ah, that doesn't look very, doesn't look very, very nice. But uh, I think yesterday I also tried this. I tried this. It, it looked much nicer, but I don't know why. But yeah. Ah, sorry. Oh, sorry. I should have pasted it in the, sorry, sorry. Made the mistake there. So I'll, I'll try again. I'll try again. So I'll create the R document and then I'm supposed to put it here. I'm supposed to paste it in the visual editor. So I'll, I'll paste it in the visual editor there and then look at the source. Yeah, there, this is much better. And then uh, you can see it's very, very convenient. No? You can see it almost formatted in the way you think it would, except for a couple of spots here and there. And this is the part where you'd have to do some more work. And then I'll just save this as big team and then render it. Mm -hmm. Hi there, much better, okay? So there's a problem with this image. So I have to download that image to make this complete, but you, you can see it's this is not so bad as a recreation of uh, what you see. But this one is uh, awful now, This uh, these tables, much more complicated. Yeah. Sorry, and let me take a look at the chat. Yeah, so there's a, uh, so there's a conversation about hyperlinking here. So I'll get back to that in a moment. Let me see the time. Ah, okay. So yeah. And then the rest are really exercises involving uh, diamond sizes and changing formats here and there. So let me just give you an example of a PDF format. So you just have to change this to PDF, okay? And then you could presumably produce a PDF file, okay? And But this one, you need to have uh, 
uh, LaTeX or LaTeX installed. Okay, and you see a PDF file that looks like this. Okay, that's not so bad. Okay, it's now integrated. And then you see you have a citation here. And then the references are here. Okay. Uh, and then another thing that I also want to point out is that when you now, when you try to look into section 28.10, the formatting of the YAML header also matters. Kind of like the similar thing that you see about the list, okay? Where a slight change in the way you input the list changes what it looks like. For the YAML header, it also is the same, okay? So you should pay attention to that too in case you want to do these things, okay? Um, yeah, uh, one thing that I want to point out that is related to what I just shown you here involving 28.10.1, is that uh, the Quarto file involved, you know, what, what I've been doing now and the big team file uh, produced two folders that contains extra information. So in that sense, the, the, these HTML files are not self-contained because when you open this, you rely on this extra folder. So people have to have this extra folder to be able to see your HTML file in its complete uh, glory. Uh, but if you want, if you have the option to make the HTML file self-contained in the sense that everything is inside that HTML file and you don't have to worry about these other uh, folders here. So just, and if you notice, the size of this HTML file is 28.5K kilobytes. But if you put in uh, embed colon resources true, in your YAML, so you'll be able to render that file. And then you would see that there's no folder that is generated. And this HTML file is now 1.3 meg. So everything is already incorporated in that at HTML file. Okay, there. So uh, I think, let me see. I think I don't have a lot of time anymore, but it's, I think essentially I've, uh, I've given you a sense of uh, what Quarto can do. And then the remaining part is really those diamond sizes and doing some of those exercises. And the nice thing is that you could weave these uh, R codes okay, directly into your document. And, uh, and there are many options here that you could explore how to put, how to put captions and figures, how to put captions and tables. All of them uh, are available in that, uh, in that, uh, document you know, in, in, in chapter 28. I think uh, I'll leave it with that for now. Yeah, so let me put the end.